Sean Haney here with RealAgriculture.com and Real Ag Radio. I'm joined right now by Farm Credit Canada's Chief Economist. It is J.P. Gervais. J.P., how's it going? It's going very well. What about yourself, Sean? I'm doing well, staying safe. Uh, you, you're obviously working from home. Everybody's working from home. We got uh, a lot more than 90% of our workforce right now is being safe at home, and so we're trying our best to serve our customers for sure. Yeah. So, JP, right now there's a lot of negative news out there, right? We we look at the manufacturing. I heard this morning some of like the automaker sales are down 10% or more. Uh, basically, no car manufacturing even happening right now in in countries like the United States, which is hard to it's hard to understand. You know, just you, you, it's unbelievable. Uh, airline traffic way down, of course. Uh, the energy sector in Canada right now, with all of this negative news, how, how do you actually get your head wrapped around the economic impacts? It's really hard. Right? We got a GDP number yesterday for January, so we're really there's a lag. There's a lag of roughly two months before you know we get the data, and 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 right now, I mean, that news got under the radar a little bit simply because now everybody's concerned about what's going on right now, and uh, we know from the January data that we were slowing down to some extent already, right, because of what was happening in China back then. So we were growing at roughly what a one percent growth on an annualized basis, and 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 you know for the entire first quarter we're probably going to be looking at what a four or five percent decline on an annualized basis, and for the first quarter of this year, uh, how do you get your head around the extent? I mean, you you need to, you know, one of the things that we've been working on or been discussing here internally is this idea of flattening the economic curve it is. You know, everybody is now familiar just watching the news and hearing about all the health officials, you know, explaining to us what it really means. You know, when you think of flattening the curve uh, from a disease standpoint, well, I think right now all the efforts, all hands on deck in terms of making sure that we're flattening the economic curve. We're, you know, governments, central banks and so forth are doing their very best to throwing a lot of things that had a lot of different issues and try the very best to sort of minimize the drop and perhaps extend it a little bit, right? So this recovery that we've been thinking about, at one point there will be a recovery. I'm absolutely sure yeah. of that. But it's just the timing of it and, and how it's going to look. And do we really want a V recovery, right? Uh, is that really the best we can hope for? Because a V recovery would mean like a very steep, and we're, we're in the middle of it for sure, but a very steep decline, perhaps for some part for sure. And I don't know if it's going to extend through all the entire second quarter, but um, and, and are we at the end of this going to be set up for a, a V type rebound, right? A steep decline, a steep recovery, and then everything's fine afterwards. I just don't know that it's realistic at this time to think yeah. along these lines. And so how do we flatten the curve, make sure that we don't go too deep uh, in terms of the decline and try to extend, you know, the, the, the little part that we're not, we're going to have to, that will have been successful in minimizing the damage, then we'll, of course, the trade-off is to extend it a little bit, but um, the recovery might actually more look like more like a U-type recovery than a V recovery. Yeah, you hear about that V bottom all the time. It's like, you know, sharp decline down. It's like an elastic band and we shoot higher. We could hope for that. I think it's, you know, nobody really knows. And I think part of it has to do with, we don't know the length of time that we're in this really, really... Uh, unprecedented period before we can get to uh, that that recovery. We, we've seen big stimulus packages in the U.S., $2 trillion. Canada has had its own package. Are, are these measures enough, JP, to, to, to kind of help us minimize the downturn? So we need it. The question is whether or not this is big enough and, and to address a significant downturn that is nothing like we've ever done, we've ever seen before, right? So, um, and just like when we went into the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009, the discussion was like, well, how much, what should be the size of the stimulus package back then? And what should be all the tools that we're now deploying? Uh, well, back then, there were a lot of question marks around whether or not this was warranted, right? So now we accept the idea of quantitative easing. We accept the ideas of emergency lending and, and central bank interventions, not just about lowering the the target rate or the policy rate of the Bank of Canada and the Federal Reserve, but then we accept the fact that you know those central banks are taking more of an active approach into the financial markets and try to inject liquidity. So all of that in 2008 and nine 
certainly was not accepted as well as it is right now. Um, there's a lot of debate, I remember, about this and a lot of debate about whether this was warranted or not. And then, you know, same kind of deal as well with regards to the stimulus package, right? The debate about whether or not it was significant uh, enough um, did happen. And it, I, I think we will never know. I think right now what I'm seeing is that we're throwing a lot of different lifelines and support. And, and I think that's the right thing to do. We're voluntarily... Uh, putting, you know, a lot of economic activity on the sidelines to deal with this huge health and human crisis. And that's the right thing to do. Um, but we've never been confronted with something like this to the extent that we're seeing. And so do we have the right set of tools. We're probably we're going to be, you know, looking back at one point and say, oh, that would have been really great if we had done this or that. But yeah. I do think that we're on the right track, I think, right now, just to make sure that we're minimizing the economic pain of, of as much as we can of a subset of, of people and businesses in the economy. And I think that's the right thing to do, um, flattening this economic curve and try to make sure that, yeah, we may extend or may make the recovery a little bit longer. But I really do think that's the right thing to do right now. Well, and agriculture is all about supply and demand, right? And, and right now in some of these commodities, we've got rather large supplies but we have big questions about demand. So whether you look at domestic consumption of beef, pork, chicken, dairy, the demand right now is is really hard to sort of understand what it looks like going forward. Because like you said, we're at unprecedented times. We, we don't know how much demand is actually going to be stifled other than what's happened at the supermarket the last two weeks. But we can't have people hoarding milk and meat <laughs> every week, eventually you've got to consume some of those products. Uh, there, there's a lot of concern about demand right now for these agricultural goods. Absolutely. Demand destruction is happening, that's for sure. I mean, there's no other way to, to, to I mean, with the decline in, in income, disposable income that we're going to that we're looking at right now, I mean, this is to be expected. I mean, the idea, though, is the little data that we have in real time, the challenges are to actually sort it out between what is actually um, hoarding or stuck it up versus what um, would be um, consumption trends that are picking up the pace because you know there's a segment of the retail that is not open for business right now, right? So everything's coming through the grocery stores right now, and or most of it anyway. And, and so that's the part that's really difficult to judge right now. But there's going to be some demand destruction, I do think. I mean, we in the aggregate, I always say, you know, if you look at uh, just, you know, sum up proteins or sum up some sort of uh, measure to to evaluate the aggregate consumption, we may not seem that much of an impact in Canada. We're going to see some of that impact elsewhere. But it'll be the shifts in what we consume that will be uh, a big deal. And so the different sectors need to sort this out, right? Even within a sector, if you think of dairy, for example, right? Not all dairy product segments are going to be affected the same. We're going to get fluid milk. That's going to see a little bit of an increase, I believe. You're going to see cream, a little bit of a decrease because that's used for the by the, the food retail or for the food service sector. You're going to see fine chains being coming down. So all these things you know, need to be sorted out. And that's... And then we don't when you don't necessarily have a situation similar to this in the past. I mean, it's really hard for industries or businesses yeah. within the sector and the supply chain to actually make decisions that in confidence. Right. So we're a little bit in the dark and how do we just go forward? Same thing for, you know, in the pork sector market or in the beef market. Well, and the other thing is, too, you know, realagriculture.com did a story on this a couple of weeks ago that, you know, with all the work from home that is happening, you know, it's impacted stats can and the amount of reports they can actually data they can collect and reports they can get out. So that also uh, doesn't help from the sort of being in the dark, not having a historical context, but also at this current time, not really having all the reports available in some of these areas like we, we normally would to understand it. Okay, recovery. Uh, a lot of focus on the, the here and now, but like you said, we're going to get out of this. We're going to get through this. Um, do you do you think that you mentioned that you sort of recovery is that the most likely? And and I guess the other question is, how how long do you think it's going to? Like, are we talking like this is going to be December thirty first, two thousand twenty one? Like, or is this a multi year thing? What, what 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 are we in store for here? I mean, right now I have a, a really hard time to not think that any type of recovery is going to be gradual. That it's it's really hard for me to say that this is going to be a V-type recovery because 
we're, I believe, in some sort of, under, will be under some sort of restrictions on the movement of people and goods and for some time. And then we're going to have businesses review their production practices and a lot of different things are going to have to be reviewed in the supply chain. And so to me right now, it's really hard to see this V-type recovery, this, this steep decline, quick rebound, and everything's good thereafter, right? So um, that's why I'm saying it's going to be a U-type recovery. It's going to take us a little bit of time. And then the more we sort of flatten this, this U and just don't make it a really deep, uh, I think it's a good thing. I think we need to solve the health crisis before we can solve the economic impact. I really do. And and, and solving the, economic, the health crisis is going to require for us to get more details and learn more about what this, uh, you know, restrictions on confinement and, and all of the social distancing and all that. And how is this going to be eased? And and for now, there's just too much that we, we don't know. But I really do am thinking about now about a, a sort of gradual recovery instead of a quick, um, a steep decline and a quick rebound. Is the Bank of Canada done? Uh, I don't know that. No, I don't think that they're done. I think that they're done with regards to their policy rate, uh, right? The target rate at 25, uh, 20, 0.25% is pretty much the floor, right? Because that's a target. So in any day of the, of, of the week, you can see the actual overnight rate, the day, the rate at which the financial institutions lend money to each other to be under the target. So if your target is at 0.25, you can actually have a few, uh, maybe 10th of a basis point under that target. And so bringing the target down to zero means that you would actually be comfortable with the idea of having short-term rates in Canada being negative from time to time. And I don't think that's in the cards right now. I don't, I quite clearly, like I said, that they're not too, totally open to the idea. And I just don't know that this is going to be something that they'll consider anytime soon. So I don't think they're done, though, in terms of injecting liquidity. Um, I'm really pleased to see, you know, if you look at uh, all the statistics in the financial markets, the capital ratios and so forth, I mean, what we know so far is that um, that doesn't seem to be a liquidity crisis around the corner. I think that's a good thing. Uh, from a financial market standpoint, it's a bit of a different story for sure in terms for the individual businesses, and that's something that, that each business needs to keep an eye on. Um, and so I'm not sure that Bank of Canada has done in terms of the um, – actions that they can take in terms of being a little bit more aggressive, perhaps in terms of asset purchases and so forth. I don't think that's that's the end of their actions. Will we see, like was being discussed in the U.S., like 30-year COVID war bonds? Is that something we could see the, the Bank of Canada do here? Well, I think every option is on the table in terms of making sure that, you know, you establish financial markets that are functioning well and, and, and preserving the ability of businesses and consumers to 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 have access to, to capital. And so if I frankly have never investigated this as a possibility, but I, I really do think that, you know, thinking outside the box is what we've done in 2008 and 2009. I think you've seen at the outset of this current crisis, relying on some of the previous tools that for which we're a little bit comfortable with because we've, you know, we've seen those tools work in the past in 2008 and 2009, for example. And I think going forward, I think we're gonna see uh, some more discussions about what can be done from central banks. JP, thanks very much for joining us here today and look forward to talking to you again soon.